Uh, thanks, Robert and Randy. Uh, first, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your group. I know um, we get a lot of questions in our product, and this really is one of the best ways us to address this in a group. Um, you know, I'm happy to take questions during the presentation at the end uh, or midway through. So if someone has a pressing question, uh, I'm happy to stop midway through. Don't have to worry about derailing me or anything like that. Um, yeah, so a little bit about myself. I'm the North American sales rep for Nod, as Robert said. Um, I take care of Canada, US, New Zealand. I'm a small scale beekeeper. Um, I think the reason why I have 60 colonies, actually it's more like 55 right now, is that um, COVID. Usually, usually, usually I, I would have about 30 colonies and that's max because I have a full-time job and my job takes me to traveling typically during bee season. So I don't have a lot of time. Since I have, wasn't traveling, I started splitting and got my numbers up, but uh, I'm gonna have to scale back down uh, if I start traveling again in the spring. A um, uh, couple of photos. Um, I live in the city, I live in Toronto, which is a major, major city. So, um, I'm basically an urban beekeeper. I keep about 15 colonies on the University of Toronto uh, Scarborough campus. That's their suburban campus. That's the photo on the left. That's my wife taking notes. I find once you get past 10 colonies, I need notes to really know what's going on. Um, top, top right, I keep about uh, six colonies in the University of Toronto downtown campus. And bottom right is one of my rural yards, hence the bear, the bear fence. I keep about uh, two different yards with about 20 colonies each in the, in the rural yards. So yeah, so I'm a, I'm a, I, can say, I consider myself a hobbyist. Some people are offended by the word hobbyist beekeeper. I'm a small scale. I say hobbyist because I don't make my living from selling honey. It's something I do for fun. It's, it's my enjoyment. You know, I make my living working for Nod. So I hope saying hobbyist doesn't offend some people. Some, some people are, don't like the word hobbyist, but anyways, I consider myself a hobby beekeeper. Um, a little bit about Nod. Uh, Nod was a, is a company that was started for beekeepers by bee, beekeepers. Um, we, next year will be 25 years. And it tells you something, you know, Robert was saying, they call it Varroa destructor, that it's a really destructive pest. And we've been trying to deal with this for 25 years and the struggle continues, which just tells you, uh, we have some good treatment options and we learned a lot, but uh, you know, it's still playing havoc, havoc in the industry and uh, a lot of colonies are being lost to, uh, to the varroa, varroa mite. And we're presently, it says we're in 27 countries, but it, we're probably more in like 32, 33 countries. We just got new registrations in the Middle East and we're actually moving into the Middle East uh, next year. We, um, just because of regulatory issues, uh, in some countries, our brand names are a little different. Most of Europe, it's Formic Pro, but uh, in Denmark, for example, uh, you can't use the word, uh, you can't name the active ingredient in your name, so you can't call it Formic. So we call it Max Plus, um, little peculiarities like that. But for most part, uh, it's Mighty Way Quick Ships and Formic Pro. Uh, I always uh, like to uh, mention to people that we don't sell our products direct to beekeepers. We sell through distribution. so all the major beekeeping supply stores and most of the smaller stores carry our, our products. But one thing we do is we do have excellent customer service that if you have white, I hope we have excellent customer service, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But if you ever do have questions uh, and you reach out to us, we have a sales and marketing team that is always available. You won't, um, you won't end up getting bounced around. You'll get somebody who calling you back usually within 24 hours. Um, as you can see, I'm the sole male there. Uh, we recently have hired uh, uh, Heather, Dr. Heather Bill. She comes to us from University of California, San Diego, and she's going to be our in-house uh, education coordinator and researcher. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., we carry the following products. Uh, Formic Pro, which is our newest product. Mighty Way Quick Strips, which was... Uh, our original product, or the third generation of our original product. Our first product is a product called Mitaway, and it was Mitaway 2, evolved into Mitaway Quick Strips. And now Mitaway Quick Strips has evolved into Formic Pro, but they are both still available. And we sell a Be Cozy Winter Wrap. If we have time, we'll, we'll touch on that later in, in the presentation. Um, so uh, I'm going to play, just before we get started, I'm going to play a quick video. Uh, 
with the life cycle and varroa mite, I think it's a, a good video for, um, uh, for, for new beekeepers to understand uh, the reproductive cycle of the varroa mite. Um, this video is also available on our website and our YouTube channel if you want to look at it further. But I'll play that now. It's a really short video. It's about three minutes. We'd like to introduce you to the Varroa mite. Well, to be precise, we'd like to introduce you to millions of Varroa mites. Why so many? Well, when it comes to the Varroa mite, there's no such thing as just one. And if you'd like to see how an infestation starts, you need to look no further than your own bees, especially drones, as they're pretty social and like to travel between hives. Since Varroa mites don't have any wings of their own, they slip into hives by hitching a ride on the backs of adult bees. And for the lucky mite, the trip includes an in-flight meal, as varroa mites will begin feeding on honeybees fat body tissue within a few minutes of clinging to the bee. Once they've entered the hive, varroa mites slip undetected into the vulnerable, uncapped brood cells. This is where the mites lay in wait until the bees cap the brood. Once a cell is capped, the mother mite, like a tiny spider, climbs atop the cocoon of the developing bee, tears open a hole, and begins to feed on its fat body tissue. Within three days, the mother mite lays her first egg, which always develops into a male. Then she lays one female egg every 30 hours over the next week or so in her newly acquired home under the brood cap. As each of these female mites mature, they mate with their brother. By the time the baby bee develops and leaves its infested cell, as many as three fertilized mites will emerge with it, and the cycle continues. Using this strategy, the varroa mite population can grow as fast as the bee population it feeds on. But when summer ends and the bee population declines, the hive is left with a huge mite population, and that's dangerous. Too many mites in a hive will overwhelm and kill entire bee colonies. So what does that mean for everyone's favorite insect, the honeybee? Well, honeybee colonies with heavy mite infestations can't effectively pollinate or produce honey because they suffer from diseases and viruses transmitted by the mites. In fact, honeybees suffer from as many as 20 different mite-induced viruses, including the devastating deformed wing virus, which prevents them from flying. If you want to give your honeybees a fighting chance against varroa mites, it's time to introduce your bees to Nod's organic mite treatments. To learn more about Nod's certified organic varroa mite treatments, visit our website at nodglobal.com. Connect with Nod and beekeepers around the world by following up. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. We'd like to introduce. Okay, so we, um, so we, you know, we're talking about the varomite as a challenge, and the sol the solution, the products that we develop for solution. Or formic acid base. Uh, I said earlier in the presentation that um, Nod was a company that was started uh, for beekeepers by beekeepers. Um, the founders of Nod, when they were looking at you know developing a product to to combat the varroa mite, they're looking at uh, <clears throat> looking at several different options, and um, they settled on formic acid. One of the reasons why they settled on on formic acid was that it's a natural organic product that will not contaminate your honey or wax. So it won't leave any residues in your honey or wax. And so it was really to protect the wholesome image of, um, of honey as a food product. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the main uh, characteristics of, of our products. And when I talk about our products, I'm talking about Mite Away Crixix and Formic Pro. Um, one, two of the main selling features of our product is one that, uh, both Mud Away Quick Chips and Formic Pro will penetrate the brood cap, um, killing mites where they reproduce under the cap. Um, it's also an organic product uh, with no known resistance, so it's not going to contaminate um, your honey or your wax. Um, many beekeepers uh, confuse oxalic acid and formic acid because they're both, they're both organic acids. They think they're one and the same. One of the key um, differences between these two products is, is that the formic acid in our formulation of Mitoway Quick Chips and Formic will penetrate the brood cap. Um, we have two treatment options, which I'm gonna talk about later. But one of the things that is important to know is that to penetrate that brood cap, you really need to be using option one, which is two strips. 
and, and we'll get we'll get into that a little bit later. The um, question I often get asked by by people who've been using our product for years is the Midway Quick Ships. Why did we come out with the Formic Pro, and why did we not replace the Midway Quick Ships, um, and are we going to replace it? And what was the reason for, for bringing out Formic Pro? Um, our Mighty Way Quick Strips had two challenges uh, for our, our resellers and for some of our commercial beekeepers. Um, one was a 12 month shelf life. The product uh, had a 12 month shelf life. So if we made it and we had it for a few months and by the time we uh, sent it to one of our dealers and perhaps they sat on it for a few months, sold some, uh, a commercial beekeeper maybe bought some thinking I'll use it in spring uh, use half, maybe didn't use half, fall rolls around, half of it's expired. So we we're always up against that short expiry date of 12 months. Uh, another challenge we had with the Mighty Way Quick Ships was that it's, uh, it was very um, sensitive to storage temperature. Now I'm not talking application temperature, I'm talking storage temperature. So it needed to be stored at room temperature or cooler. Um, if you were storing this, you know, in a barn or a metal shed, and particularly with, for some of our beekeepers in the southern regions, it, it, um, it just didn't store well hot. If it was stored too hot, um, our polysaccharide gel pads would break down. Um, and this would happen sometimes before the expiry date. Um, when the polysaccharide breaks down, one of the side effects to that is it actually becomes stronger, not weaker. So instead of vaporing off slowly over a seven day period, it would be like a, a very fast vaporing off, like a very sort of shock treatment. Um, so in developing Formic Pro, we wanted to sort of combat those two issues. Um, the Formic Acid content is, is, is almost similar. It's almost identical in both products. We added some organic uh, binders and stiffeners to the Formic Pro. The result was we achieved a 24 month shelf life, a two year shelf life. And Formic Pro is, is much more stable for storage tempers, temperature. So it can be store, stored um, in hotter, hotter, hotter environments. Um, we still recommend room temperature or cooler, but if you do, if you are storing it in a metal shed or in a barn somewhere where it gets really hot, um, as long as it's out of direct sunlight, it still stores uh, a pre pre pretty good. So some differences at a glance. Um, like I said, they both have two treatment options. Um, our Mighty Way Quick Strips, option one was two strips for seven days. And our former Pro is two strips for 14 days. And we call this the under the cap kill uh, treatment. Um, option two, Mighty Way Quick Strips with one strip for seven days. You wait seven days. On day 14, you apply a second strip for, for seven days. Formic Pro is one strip for 10 days. You apply the second strip on day 10 for a total of 20 days. Uh, we call this phoretic dispersal phase. Um, one of the things, and these are questions we're getting a lot now. I think on this issue, we could have been done a better job in our marketing in, in, in giving this message. You will get some penetration below the cap with the one plus one, but nowhere near penetrating cap when you do two full strips. Um, so like I said, in our marketing, I think we could have been clear. A lot of people think that um, I can choose option one or option two, and they're both the same, and I'll have the same results. That's really not, not, not so. Um, and I talked about the, sh the shelf life. Um, if you, you, um, if you do store the product frozen, it won't extend the uh, expiry date, the shelf life, but it does store very well, and you can put it in the high frozen. Um, so why, you know, I get, I get asked the question often, if two strips, uh, option one, two strips, full dose is a stronger uh, application, and you're going to get more kill below the um, cap, why do we have option two, the one plus one? Um, myself, I run single brood boxes. You, you need a minimum of six frames of bees to be using our product. Sometimes when I'm going through my yard and I get to a, a particular hive and I'm looking at it and think, oh, is it really five, six frames of bees? It seems a little weaker than the rest of the hives. In a case like that, uh, when I'm in doubt, I leave one out, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to go with the one plus one method on that hive. Um, cause typically if it's, if it's, if it doesn't have a lot of bees and it's, last it probably doesn't have a lot of a lot of cat brood so my recommendation is if you got a strong colony with a high mite load and a lot of cat brood 
option option one, two strips in both these treatments is the better option. Uh, as far as placement of the strips, um, if you're, uh, we'll, we'll look at into that, get into that in a minute. Um, so I basically went through most of this. The option one, two strips for seven days with Max. Um, Formic Pro, it's two strips for 14 days. Um, one of the uh, cr critical things when it comes to having a successful outcome with our product, um, one is hive strength. You need a minimum of six frames of bees. Th this is not a treatment for nucleus colonies. This is for strong established colonies. Um, the reason why we say you need six frames of bees is this is a vapor. It, it's not a contact strip. Anyone who's ever used uh, any synthetic miticides like Apivar, Apistan, Baverol, or Checkmite, any of those synthetic strips, they're contact strips. And what that means is when the bees uh, walk on the strips, they touch each other, they touch other bees, the mites come in contact with the active ingredient, and that's how the active ingredient is dispersed. Uh, Mind away quick strips and Formic Pro doesn't work like that. It's not a contact, it's a vapor. When you put the strips in, they vapor off, the hive um, starts to fill up with vapors, and the bees start fanning and moving those vapors around. Just the action of the bees fanning, they, they take an active process in making this product work by moving the vapors, vapors around. And what we, we, we've come to learn through our research is that anything less than five frames of bees, um, the vapors can overwhelm the bees. There's not enough bees to uh, move those vapors around and you could end up with a much higher um, bee mortality and possible queen loss. So, so high strength is, is very important. Uh, second is temperature. Application temperature on both these products needs to be, and we're talking daytime temperatures, needs to be between 50 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, one of the confusing parts for a lot of people, particularly this time of year, like August, people will call me if they're using Formic Pro, um, they'll say, uh, there's no way I'm gonna get a 14 day window in August where I am, it's too hot. I won't get 14 days below 85. Actually, most of the vaporing off is gonna happen in the first three to four days. So when you're planning your treatment, you're looking for a temperature window of three to four days. That's the critical time. As long as you're below 85, first three, four days, you're good. If it creeps up to 90, day five, day, day six, not, it's, not, it's not critical. It's the first three to four days. And it's the same thing with the Mighty Way Quick Strips. It's, it, it's, it, it's, you, you, if you have seven days or you have 14 days, that's great. But it's really the first three to four are the critical days. Um, another thing that sort of ties in with the temperature is not a great idea to be treating in the first or second day when it's raining. You really wanna try and see that the bees are fanning. Uh, quite often my very strong hives where there's a lot of bees in the box. Um, when I put my, and I always work, use two strips, um, a lot of bees will come outside and beard on the front so that they can make space for the other bees to fan inside. It's, it's pretty common observance, pretty normal. Um, I run single brood boxes, I don't run doubles. When I treat, I typically have one or two medium supers on. So hive strength, uh, temperature, and ventilation. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about ventilation. Uh, the, um, we'll, talk, we'll talk about ventilation now, but we'll, we'll come back to it a little later. Um, it's really important, one, not to have any entrance juices on. You want your entrance juices fully open. If you have an upper entrance, that's fine. Um, as far as screen bottom boards, a lot of people think that if they have a screen bottom board, they'll leave it open and they have more ventilation. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but we actually prefer that if you have an inspection board that you slide it in and you close the screen bottom board um, because of, by leaving the screen bottom board open, um, you're, going to, you're going to lose some of, the, some of the vapor. It's going to dump out a little bit. So in all our testing, we, um, we recommend closing the screen bottom board. Um, on a side note, Randy Oliver, uh, for those of you who are familiar with him, he's a commercial beekeeper in um, Northern California who runs a website called Scientific Beekeeping. Randy has done some testing with our, with our Formic Pro with screen bottom boards uh, open, not closed. And, and he says it basically lowered the efficacy only about 5%. 
So it still works. FC goes, FC went down about 5%. We still recommend closing the, um, the screen bottom board. Okay, uh, for anyone who, who hasn't used our product before, or maybe has, a uh, slight packaging change. Uh, our strips used to come in a clear plastic sachet. Um, and they were kind of a killer to open. You needed a pair of scissors or a hive tool and that plastic was, was quite challenging to get open. We switched to this Mylar foil type material, which um, opens quite easy. You don't need scissors, you can cut them, but it's almost like a bag of potato chips they pull open. Inside what you'll find is two strips. Our product is what we call polysaccharide. So it's basically sugar, multiple sugars, impregnated with the formic acid. And it's wrapped with a white paper. It's an ecoic paper. And this is not a wrapper. It's an integral part of the product. Um, and that ecoic paper, which gives it the slow release. Um, so in, in the case of Mighty White Quick Sips, it slow releases over seven days. And in the case of Formic Pro, it slowly releases over 14 days. Um, that wrapper does not come off. If you do take that wrapper off, um, you're, what you're gonna end up with is um, you lose the slow release technology and it's like one big flash and it can be very hard on the bees and hard on the queen. So definitely a white wrapper does, does not come off. Okay, so we talked about temperature. Uh, we talked about hive strength, um, ventilation. Um, uh, as far as most small scale hobbyists go, we're, we're, if you're using standard Langstroth equipment, then you've got a fully open entrance and you're using entrance reducers. So like I said, entrance reducers come off. Uh, if you're a commercial beekeeper, uh, I'm not sure if there's any commercial beekeepers on tonight or somebody who's palletized, but many commercial beekeepers um, uh, have their sort of entrance reducers built into their pallets, which means they're always only partially open and that's really not enough ventilation for our product. Um, so on bottom right here, so your, op your options are to one, put a shim underneath to get like a half inch opening. I don't know of any commercial beekeepers who do that. Um, or your other option is to do a setback, move, move the box back or forward a half inch. Um, again, not a big deal because when you're putting in your strips, the strips go in between the two brood boxes. You're gonna be lifting that box off anyways. When you put your strips down, when you're you put the upper brew box back on, you just set it back half inch. That's what most of our commercial guys do who have very small and entrances and it works fine for them. Um, placement of the strips. Uh, like I said, I run single brew boxes. Um, you basically want, both Mighty Way Quick Chips and Formic Pro are brood treatments. So we're trying to kill mites in underneath the cap. So placement of the strips should always be close to the center of the heart of the brood nest. Um, the first picture on the left, a single, again. personally, even though I run singles, I would never put two strips on just a single by itself. When I do my treatments, I always at least one honey super on and usually two. So in my case, I would have two mediums on, on here. Um, if you're running double brood boxes, uh, you would put your strips between the two brood boxes. You're trying to go, you know, on each edge. So, so the strips are in the center of the brood nest. Uh, you can put your queen excluder and supers on top. And keeping in mind, this product is can be used during the nectar flow while your supers are on. It will not contaminate your wax or your honey. Um, one thing we don't have in this diagram, when we did our initial registration, um, most people were using 10 frame Langstroth equipment, uh, deeps and mediums. Uh, in the last few years, we're seeing more and more people using uh, eight frame equipment, eight frame deeps as brood boxes. Some people are using solely eight frame uh, medium boxes as, as, uh, as their brood boxes. If, you're, um, if you are using eight frame equipment and you're using mediums, um, I often get asked, where do I put the strips? I run three, uh, three brood boxes. Um, in a case of three medium brood boxes, we would say between the top two boxes only because the medium boxes, if you were to put your strips on the lower box, it's so close to the entrance that we think you'd be losing too much vapors that, that close to the bottom of the hive. So we'd say between the upper two boxes. Um, 
I don't know, um, Robert, uh, Robert, uh, if you are, um, if we're going to do questions at the end, or if you want to stop halfway through, um, just, just, just let me know if anyone has a burning question, I'm willing to stop. Um, okay, so we, um, you've done your treatment. It's the first time you're using your fir first time you're using it. Um, calming observances. Like I said earlier, it's not uncommon at all to see some bearding. Now, I'm not sure why, but with my particular hives, and maybe it's because uh, I, I use Formic twice a year uh, for the last 10 years, um, I don't see a lot of bearding. Every now and again, I'll get one or two hives with excessive bearding. For the most part, I don't see a lot. I also try not to push the temperature limit. Like, even though we say 85, personally myself, I always try to shoot for a window around 80. It's 85 fine, but I don't push it past that. If you're using the product and it's 90 degrees, you're going to see some bearding, definitely. Um, it's also not uncommon um, for your queen to um, stop laying for a few days to a week. Uh, it will it will kill some some eggs and some young some young brood. Uh, keep in mind the formic acid is trying to penetrate the brood cap. So if it's strong enough to penetrate the brood cap, it's probably going to have a negative effect on some of your your younger brood. Again, it's to be expected. Um, as far as um, bee kill, uh, I always see a couple hundred dead bees outside the hive. Uh, people who've used the product uh, over the years, they get used to this. They know it's normal. People who use it for the first time, yeah, it freaks them out. I get that. You know, I get calls regularly. Hey, I just treated for the first time with Max or Former Pro. And, you know, sometimes I have thousands of dead bees on my, um, my landing board. And I usually ask people to send me a photo or, or send me a video. And it's, it's not thousands, it's usually a couple hundred. Sometimes I'll tell people to sweep them up and put them in a, in a jar and see how much there is. And typically what you're seeing is a couple hundred bees, the same as if you were to do an alcohol wash, which really is uh, insignificant um, as far as the, in, in the, in the life of the hive for the si size of the colony. You know, average colony can have anywhere from 50 to 60,000 bees with a healthy colony. Um, I was asked, uh, hey, Tom. yes. Um, yep. There's a question. Is there? Um, I think it's relevant that we ask it now. One person sure. is asking: Is there such thing as too many boxes with the treatment? Yeah, you know that that's a good question. There, there's a, a commercial beekeeper who I like and respect in Vermont, and uh, you know he says, you know, and I I, I read, you know, I I follow some of the Facebook pages, and I saw him post recently saying, you know, I just can't use Formic Pro; it doesn't work for me, right? Um, now, I happen to know his situation. His standard brood box configuration is two deeps with a medium. So uh, a medium in between two deeps. Uh, he supers really early in the, in the season. So he comes out of his winter in Vermont and he throws on three or four supers. So now you've got six to seven boxes on. Uh, yeah, I, I think in a case like that, the cavity might be too big. Um, I used to run doubles. I ran doubles for quite a few years. And when I treated with my double brood boxes, you know, 10 frame deeps, um, I treated 10 frame deeps with two and three supers on. Um, and it was pretty, pretty effective. So I think um, going beyond that, um, your cavity might be too big. We don't have any hard data on that, but I, I, yeah, just anecdotally and talking to people I know who, who run, run their colonies that way. Um, one of the ways I get around that myself is, and, and it just works for me in, in my environment, is, see, I typically pull my honey off before I treat. Um, I'll have three or four honey supers on. Um, I pull those off. And usually uh, when, I'm getting, when I'm getting close to pulling honey, I like to have one underneath that they're working on because I use bee escapes to get my, my honey supers off. Um, so I know that that lower box is never, is never ready when I'm pulling my first round of honey. Um, so e even in August, when I'm, when I'm treating late in August, uh, I'll pull the honey, put my strips on with that one super they're working on, and sometimes add a second empty super. So I, I, uh, you know, I hope that answers, Robert. Um, but yeah. I, don't, I don't know what the exact perfect. number is, but yes, I think there is, there, there is such a thing as, as too many boxes. So, so I know, for example, someone, um, you know, I, I joke with this individual and I say they have the Trump hive 
it's a tower of seven, eight boxes. A lot of them are medium uh, deep, uh, but they're eight frames. In a case like that, would you even put more than two strips? So you're effective. Oh, you mean? Oh, you mean because you have so many boxes on, add more strips? Correct. I I would never personally no. I would never put more than two strips on at a time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've had situations where, um, not in quite a few years, but I've had situations where extreme mite loads. You know, things got out of hand. Extreme mite loads. I did my my full dose two strip application. Did a pretty decent knockdown, but there was still some mites. And I would follow up. You know, ten days later with a single strip. But no, I would never. I would never put more than two strips in a hive at once, regardless of how many boxes you had on top. Okay. I think they're going to be asking for queen issues with, with that. Okay, and the other, only other question I see here is: Would you remove the queen excluder before the treatment? Um, I don't, you know. And I used to, I used to I used to wrestle with that, and um, because I only I run deeps for my brood boxes, and I run uh, mediums for honey, and I really try not to get brood in my uh, honey supers. I mean, there's always those situations where things go awry and a virgin flies in and, you know, surprise, surprise, you see some brood in your, in your supers. But um, no, I, I, I leave my queen excluders on, but I, I think that's why it's important to have the two, you know, the two boxes, at least one or two boxes on top of the excluder, because it just gives them that extra room to move the vapors around so the vapors can move up. So the queen doesn't get overwhelmed being down there. You know, if you if you were to treat, say, you know, just a single brood box without putting those supers on, I, I think the queen would have nowhere to go. She would get overwhelmed with, with vapors, at least by putting those two boxes, you know, the bees will fan and move the vapors up. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, one thing, uh, one thing I didn't touch on, um, why is my computer not, not, not going forward? There we go. Yeah, one, one, th one thing I didn't touch on is... Um, you know, regardless of whether using our our product, Nod's products, or or anyone any other product, my my personal belief is, you know, there's two schools of thought. Some people just treat prophylactically; they treat in spring and fall, and they don't know what their mite numbers are. Um, my preference is to know to know your mite numbers. I think people should. Um, we recommend you know doing all call washes, knowing what your mite levels are throughout throughout the season. Like personally myself, I do all call washes, all call washes once a month. You know from uh, from May from May to October, I'm doing all call all call wash at least once a month, and I'm definitely doing an all call wash post treatment because you want to know did the treatment work. And in the case of of uh, of Moida Way Quick Suction Format Pro, I typically wait a week after the last day of treatment. So after your 14 day treatment in Formic Pro, I'll do my all call wash, you know, seven days later on day, day 21. Um, and and I, I, you know, I, I think that's important. Um, I'm running into, on a daily basis, I get people call me and say, I'm thinking about doing my treatment. Is today a good day to put on Formic Pro? What's the temperature recommendations? And I'll ask them their mite numbers and they don't know. They haven't done an all call wash, a sugar shake, or they're not using a sticky board. And, you know, in a case like that, I mean, one, maybe they have no mites, maybe they don't even need to treat. So they're just wasting time and money. Or maybe their mites, maybe their, uh, their levels are so high that they should base what treatment they're using based on their mite numbers. So I'm, I'm just a big believer in, in knowing what your mite levels are. And for, for new bee, beekeepers who are, or who are on here, if you haven't, um, if you haven't uh, learned how to do an all-call wash or a sugar shake, I, th I think you should get one of your experienced you know, members at the club to walk you through it. There's lots of videos online. I don't know, the Bee Informed Partnership has, uh, or, or excuse me, the Honey Bee Health Coalition has a great Varroa guide with um, videos and all, all the products, how to use them, when to use them, proper time to use them. And they walk you through all the monitoring methods, you know, all call wash, sugar shake. Um, so I'll just leave it at that because I can get carried away with my, <laughs> with my belief in that. But I, I think that's a, a skill that all beekeepers really should have. Um, so Tom, uh, if I may interrupt and yeah. interject here, I, I have a co uh, an apiary with nine colonies in it. Randy and I were inspecting it yesterday and I decided, you know, we decided to do a mite wash. Uh, we got 12 mites per 100 bees. 
in one colony. And I was, I was like uh, dumbfounded because I treated that colony did, in did May say, with Formic Pro. Did you say 12 percent? Did you say 12 for yeah. 100 bees? So that would have been 36 and a 300. Like, do you take half a cup Correct. of bees like 300 mites? Correct. And then we went to the second colony and we tested and there was zero. So I don't know if we lucked out and we had a frame loaded with mites. But the reason I'm saying this is when you sample your colonies, don't test one colony and say, oh, I got too many mites or I have no mites. If it happened, if this is the theory that we followed and we tested the second hive, we would have had zero mites and we would have uh, figured, oh, we don't have mites in this apiary, so let's not treat. I ended yeah. up treating every colony in there with Formic Pro yesterday. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot to unpack in there. What you're saying, um, you know, I was listening to, uh, you know, to a little uh, video. Uh, yeah, there's a very a chit chat series between Bob Binney, who's a beekeeper in Georgia, with uh, Jennifer Berry, who's a researcher also at the University of Georgia, and when they were, they were talking about mite control and different products they were trying, they were talking a lot about auxilic acid. But one of the things that Jennifer said, uh, she said she used to tell people, you know, to use IPM and, you know, only treat the, your colonies in the yard that were above threshold. That's kind of how IPM works. Uh, she says she has backtracked and doesn't do that anymore. And she, she now believes what I believe is that you think of your yard as a super organism. If you have, you know, three yard, three hives that are your nine that are above threshold and have a high mite load. If you don't treat all the hives in the yard, they're eventually going to spread to the other, the other colonies. So we, we believe in treating, treating yards, like not to treat colonies individually in a yard. Um, and I think that's just good practice. If, if you view your, your yard as a super organism. Um, the other thing, Robert, you mentioned on here, and this is a harder one to, um, it's a harder one to, to really sort of to understand and to explain, and it's even challenging you know, for, for myself, is that we know that treating with Formic Pro with two strips, you're going to penetrate the brood cap. We know that you're probably going to kill about 50% of the foundress mites, the female foundress mites. We know that when it penetrates the brood cap, you're going to kill well above 90% of the offspring. And that's the male mites and the female, female mites that you know, the foundress mite first lays because they're, 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 you know, they're not as developed, they're, they're, their exoskeleton is softer, they're just easier to penetrate, they're easier to kill. Um, so having said that, if we're only killing half of the uh, foundress mites under the cap, if you have a big strong colony with a very high mite load, um, you know how alcohol washes work is you're only, you know, dep depending on who you talk to or whose research you're talking to is most of the mites are under the cap. So when you're sampling, you're sampling the mites that you find on, on, on the adult bees, the phoretic mites, which typically could be around 20 to 30, 30%, you know, 70 to 80% of the mites are under the cap. So if you have a big, strong colony, and you got, you got a lot of frames of cat brood and you have a huge infestation. Um, if you kill half of those reproductive mites and 90% of the offspring, you pretty much interrupted the reproductive cycle of the mite. But when you do an alcohol wash, you, you still may get a high count because of you know, the half of the founders mites that you didn't kill. And this is sort of, um, this, is the, this is sort of the challenge because you know, the whole all call wash is designed to monitor phoretic mites, not mites under the cap. Right. Yeah. So, so I know myself, um, I'm pr I have a pretty good integrated pest management program. I usually don't let my mites get um, very high mite levels. It does happen. I mean, sometimes there's reinfestation, but I usually suggest to people that if you have very high mite loads and you got a lot of cap brood, um, you may have to do a second treatment or you may have to follow up in cases where I've done my, my two strips and I know I've had a lot of, uh, cat brood with a high, with a high mite count. Um, I go back, you know, seven days at the end or on day 21, seven days after the 14 day treatment. If I see, if I still see a high, high mite count, 
I'll do a second treatment of, of one strip, maybe the one plus one, because most of the root has hatched out. And I, I guess what I'm saying is that the, um, our expectations of, you know, having a favorite treatment that you're going to pop in there once a year and it's going to be the one you use all the time. Uh, those days are, are, are long gone. Mites, mites are too virulent. There's too many mites. Um, there's too many beekeepers around, you know, uh, like I know you guys got a lot of beekeepers in, in, in Ohio. Um, so really, you know, I talked earlier about the Honeybee Health Coalition Varroa Guide, and I think it's really important for beekeepers to know that, you know, you may love Formic Pro, but there's going to be times of the year that you can't use it because it's not appropriate temperature wise. Um, you know, you might love Abivar and it works great at certain times of year, but there's times of year you can't use it. So I really think it's important for beekeepers to know what products are available in the US, which products are registered, when and how to use them so that you can have a, a program of, um, of not always relying on the same, same product at the same time every year. I mean, in my case, I typically treat twice a year with Formic Pro. Um, I have followed up with auxilic acid in the fall, but for most part, I use Formic twice a year. But it's maintaining my numbers that are, are typically low. I don't ever let them escalate. Um, uh, was there a question there? <clears throat> we were just going to ask about the um, uh, do you come immunity, the immunity to the Formic? Yeah, you, you know, we, oh, you mean like resistance? Yes, that's the word I want. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you know, in the past, I've said, you know, the mites aren't going to develop resistance to Formic Pro, but, you know, scientists have learned over the years never say never, <laughs> you know, because strange, but um, it works very differently than some of the synthetic miticides that are neurotoxins, right? It's an acid and it is a burn. Um, all I can say is that in, in the past 20, 20 years of formic acid being used in Canada and Europe, um, there is no documented cases of resistance. It's highly unlikely that we're going to see resistance, but, um, you know, I guess you can never say never, you know, species do evolve and, and mites do evolve, but it, it's not likely. Um, one, one of the issues around resistance uh, and a question that comes up um, Robert, don't let me, I want to come back to queen loss, right? Um, so so let, let me come back to that. But answering the question on, on resistance, um, question I often get asked uh, by new beekeepers is I put my strips in on day 14, but I'm going on vacation and do I really need to get those strips in on day 14 or is it a, is, is, is a problem if I leave them in, right? We've all been taught when we take our, our beekeeping courses and our integrated pest management courses, and uh, based on using synthetic miticides like Apivar, Apistan, Baverol, Checkmite, those products, it's really important that at the end of the treatment cycle, you take them out. They got to come out at the end, you know, Apivar needs to come out on day 42. And the reason for that is if you have small amounts of the active ingredient, that's how the mites develop resistance by being exposed to these small amounts. Um, pretty different scenario with the, with the, with the uh, formic acid because again, it, it acts like a burn. It's not a neurotoxin. So we tell people, no, don't make a special trip to the ER. They should come out. You know, we don't, we don't think it's a good idea to leave them in all winter. People have done it. Would it do any harm? No, but it's not a good practice. Um, so, you know, and even commercial beekeepers, we tell them, you know, just take them out on your next planned trip to the BR. Don't make a special trip to go back and take out strips. Um, but again, in the case of synthetic medicines, yeah, I'd be making a special trip back to take those strips out because it's, it's important. Uh, I, ho I hope that answer answered your question. Um, Robert, uh, the issue, uh, somebody asked about queen, lo queen loss in, in the comments where I talk about queen loss. Um, one of the things um, that we're up against a lot, particularly on some of the forums and stuff, is that uh, a lot of people say, if you use formic acid, you're gonna lose queens. Is it, is it possible? Yes, but there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate that. And we talked about, you know, proper hive strength, uh, ventilation and temperature. Anything, you know, 
you put an interim to reducer on, you're going to risk overwhelming the hive, which could be queen loss. Uh, if you put a robin screen on where they can't fan and get proper rinse, you could end up with queen loss. If you're treating well above the recommended temperature guideline, if you're well above 90, you could end up with queen loss. Um, but what if you follow all the recommended uh, uh, applica application guidelines? Can you still have queen loss? I know myself, um, all, I have experienced uh, queen supersedure. And usually in my case, like I, I haven't treated my uh, August treatment yet this year, but a uh, year before last, uh, I had uh, a roof at the University of Toronto with about 14 colonies on it. Um, I treated them all late August. When I went back, there was three colonies that had a whole bunch of superseder cells in all three colonies. Clearly they, 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 they were superseding the queen. Um, when I went back to my notes, all of them were third year queens. Um, so usually you're not going to see supersedure with young, well-mated queens. It's going to be your older queens. Uh, I remember when I, when I first started working for Nod, we had a commercial beekeeper in North Dakota runs about 3,500 colonies, uh, has been using the Mighty Way Quixel for years, likes it. Uh, I asked him uh, about his experience with queen loss. I said, so, so tell me, what's your experience with queen loss? And his, his reply to me, and it's, it's pretty much what I experienced. He said, I lose about 10% of my queens a year. He said, when I treat with the Mighty Way Quickship, that number doesn't change. It just happens instantly. And what he's saying is that when I treat, it'll push out my older queens where they were going to supersede it anyways. So I build my management around that. Um, but I don't see it with younger queens. Um, I think you might see with poorly mated queens and older queens, but in, it, it's my belief that when you're following the guidelines and you're, you're, you can mitigate any queen loss by watching your temperature, watching your ventilation. Um, but, it, but it does happen. But for me, it's, it's, it's not, has not been an issue. I, I think it's just one of those things that gets repeated uh, you know, a, a Facebook post <laughs> that I read a couple of weeks ago kind of went like, what do you guys use to treat? And they all named their favorite treatment. One guy said Formic Pro. The next guy said, oh, I wouldn't use that. It kills queens. And the guy, guy said to him, well, how many queens have you lost? He goes, well, I've never used it. Because I've used it for, for the last three years and I haven't lost queens. But that's one of the issues we're up, uh, up against. It does happen, but I think it, it's kind of overly exaggerated. Uh, any other sort of questions on that? Um, for anybody, for anybody who's interested, you know, we do have a lot of re research on our um, on our website. People ask us about efficacy numbers, and you know, I find it really hard to uh, to pin down efficacy numbers. Uh, our mighty way quick steps, we say, are run between ninety and ninety nine percent. Former uh, pro about eighty three to ninety seven. Um, these FK numbers will be on ideal conditions. Uh, one of the challenges with all organic acids is they're a little more volatile. Um, you might see, you know, different situations depending on temperature, depending on humidity. Um, so that's why we think it's important to try and treat um, with within the recommended temperature guidelines. Um, for yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that Randy Oliver was uh, has done a lot of research with our product. Um, one of the things that you know he was driving home in this photo is that um, when you put in the strips, it's going to interrupt your your queen laying. You know she's going to stop laying for a few days. A lot of people have concerns that you know if your queen starts laying, it's going to have a negative impact on your on your on your honey on your honey because maybe they're not going to be bringing in nectar. Um, as you can tell from 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 this photo, this was like um, at, at four weeks, so clearly it didn't have an impact on, on this colony bringing in nectar. The um, brood patterns. I experienced this. I think anyone who's used the product for more than a few times will see this. Um, I've had some pretty, not the greatest brood patterns. Uh, I've treated with my in previously Max and Formic Pro. Um, a few weeks down the road, a couple of brood cycles. I'm looking at really nice brood patterns. Um, we think that, you know, the formic acid almost has like a cleansing effect on, on, the, on the, on the colonies, uh, with our new researcher, a doctor, uh, Dr. Heather Bell, one of the projects that she's going to be working on, 
with a partnership with some of the other universities is um, we want to answer that question. Um, does formic acid have a, a positive impact on viruses? Because um, one of the things I didn't mention, uh, we talk about um, treating for mites and killing mites, but that's just half of the equation. We're, we're, we're treating mites, killing mites to stop the spread of viruses. It's, it's the mites that spread the viruses that ultimately lead to, you know, uh, colony loss and colony mortality. Yeah, so like I said, if you're really interested in research, we have internal research and third party research on our website. I'm a big fan of this right here, the tools for varroa management, the Honeybee Health Coalition. Um, we can take uh, we can take some questions now on the product there, or if you want, we can talk a little bit about our winter hive wrap, but I'm happy to stop here and uh, answer, answer any questions. Hey, Tom, I have a question regarding your IPM. And, um, you know, of course, you're a, a nod salesperson. And do you only use formic pro or formic acid? Or do you also use other organic acids to, uh, uh, you know, in your IPM and stuff like that? And what, well, oh, by the way, what time of year do you use those different methods as well? Yeah, sure. Just, just, just to give you a little bit of history on me, Matt, and, uh, and that's why, you know, with the treatment-free beekeepers, I'm not as hard on them as some people are. Uh, when I started beekeeping, the first book somebody gave me, <laughs> which, you know, was a book on treatment-free beekeeping. So my first two years, I tried not treating, couldn't keep my hives alive over the winter. Um, uh, I didn't have a lot of bee education when I, when I, when I did that. Uh, I was on an organic farm. I was on a farm that where they were trying to get organically certified for, for their food crops they were growing. So I was told that I, I had to use only organic treatments. So at the time, this was before Formic Pro, I was using the Mitoway Quick Shifts. This is before I worked for Nod um, because there was only that. And in Canada, we have a thymol product called Thymobar. Um, so just for that reason, I was only using Mitoway Quick Shifts. I have since moved off that farm and I have hives in different rural areas. Um, my typical year for me is our spring is late May, you know, May 24th to June 1st. Um, in that area would be my spring treatment of Formic Pro, which is typically two strips. Uh, we used to say fall, but now I prefer to say late summer. I try to have my second treatment done by the third week of August, which is typically two strips of Formic Pro. What I do normally is I'll do an alcohol wash post-treatment and I'm usually okay, but come October, October, I'll do another alcohol wash. And sometimes what I do in October, uh, I've done auxilic acid dribble method um, with good results. But the last couple of years, I usually do just one round or two of aux auxilic acid sublimation. And really I'm doing it just as a test to see what falls, right? I'll always see a little, a few, a little bit of mite fall. I'll see, and, and when I, when I, you know, if I see a small mite fall, I say, okay, that's good. That's not a lot of mites. If I do that auxilic acid um, sublimation, I see a big mite fall. I realize I dropped the ball. I, I treated too late or I, you know, I didn't follow up right after August or my, or my alcohol washes are wrong. So it's never, but it's never more than two, two vaporizing and I'll, and I'll do them usually a couple of days apart. I see. And when you say sublimation, you're talking about OA vapor. Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah. Vapor. I use, okay. I use a yep. very simple device called the Virox vaporizer. Yep. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you. But I kind of use it more as a monitoring tool and a treatment tool, because I'm not ex expecting a big mite drop. One, one, one of the, on that issue, a trend we started seeing here in Ontario, and this was with some of the newer beekeepers, particularly the ones who are inclined not to treat. Um, they wouldn't treat in the spring, no treating the summer. By midsummer, they start seeing mites on their bees. And you know now, now that obviously they got a high infestation rate. Um, and, they would start vaporizing with auxilic acid in October, right? And we'd see posts where they, you know, the first round of vapor, and you see thousand mites and they take a picture and they post it on Facebook. And then five days later, they vaporize again and see another massive mite drop. And, you know, we have this joke at the office. We say, hey, you know, we're not in the mite killing business. We're in the honeybee health business. Your mite levels should have never gotten that high, let alone be that high in October. So when we see people vaporizing in October and you're seeing massive mite drops and they do this two and three times, and you, right? Typically those hives will go into winter 
uh, they've, you know, big in colony, they fed, they see this mite drop. By spring, those colonies will dwindle down because there's probably high viral loads if the colony survives at all. And then they wonder what happened. I treated, you know, but really it was too little too late. So I'm, I'm not against using auxilic acid uh, vaporizer or sublimation method. Um, I just think it's like any other tool. You got to use it at the right time. Um, we see a lot of people here now actually vaporizing in the summertime too, which makes no sense because there's way too much cat brood and you're not penetrating the cat broods. So you're just trying to play catch up. I think it is a good fall cleanup treatment. I think you can do it in the spring um, before there's a lot of cat brood, but vaporizing when you have a lot of cat brood is kind of pointless. Yeah, but, I, but be, I'll be honest with you, no, I, I don't, I haven't, um, formic acid and auxilic acid is basically what I use. All right, thank you. Um, uh, there is a question here on, uh, uh, Walt actually is asking, I use eight frame hives. Is it more efficient to use one pad at a time? Is that more efficient on eight frames than it is on 10 frames? Is he using eight frame deep brood boxes or eight frame medium brood boxes? Uh, he did not say, I'm assuming deep. Yeah, if, you, if you're using two eight frame deep boxes and you got a honey super on, I'd probably still go with the two strips. Um, if you're using eight frame medium boxes, which a lot of people are doing for brood boxes, I'd probably go with the one plus one method. And would you, would you add a super anyway, just to give them more room when you do that? Yeah, if, you, yeah, if, if you're running uh, eight frame, two deep eight frame boxes, yeah, I'd still I'd still put a super or two on. Yeah, the other thing I tell new beekeepers too is, in the in the first year, sometimes new beekeepers don't have um, drawn frames for their for their honey supers. Uh, in that case, I would still put the box with the foundation in it, even though there's nothing drawn in it. The bees can still go up, get on that foundation and fan and move the vapors around. I wouldn't put an empty box with no frames. I would put the empty box with with the uh, with foundation and then post treatment, if you want to take that box off to shake the bees back down, that's something that's that some some new beekeepers do when they don't have foundation. Uh, I have a question. When you're using the two strips, uh, a Formic Pro, uh, can you go in the hive on day ten or day nine just because you're worried there are too many bees dead and you're anxious to see what's going on and what would that do to your uh, treatment? since most of the acid evaporates yeah. the first few. By day nine or day 10, the pads are pretty much done, yes. Um, I wouldn't go any sooner than that. Okay. You know, I, 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 get, I get asked a lot too. I get, you know, the whole range of questions. Like for example, people say, uh, I put my strips on and now I wanna go put a honey super on. You know, can I take the inner cover, outer cover off and throw on a honey super? Well, no, we say no, because now you're going to let all the vapors out, right? So once the strips are in, you don't want to disturb them, let the vapors out. Um, unless, of course, you're already at day nine, day 10, but for most part, let the treatment run its course before you open the hive. Here's a question from Carol. <clears throat> she asks, uh, when you sample uh, for mites on uncapped brood, rarely do I find lots of uncapped brood on a frame this time of year? Does it matter? Yeah, I, I, I have that same problem. Um, this time of year, I typically like to see some older brood that's not capped. And sometimes I can't find that. So next best thing is take it from the, from the capped brood frames. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. We try to do, you know, ideal, but sometimes, you know, how beekeeping is, it doesn't always work that way. Um, I know myself, I, I, you know, honestly, I, like everyone else, I'm up against time. I'll do my sample. I'll, I'll try to find a frame that has open brood that's older. It's about to be capped. That's what I sample from. And I usually sample from one frame. You know, I've heard other people, other researchers and educators say, you know, it's good to sample from more than one frame. You know, if you're inclined to do that, probably not a bad idea. But, you know, when you've got, you've got maybe two or three colonies in your backyard, yeah, go ahead. But when you've got 
you know, when you're, when you're sampling 30 colonies or maybe 100 colonies, you know, I'll just sample from one, one frame. The other thing I do too, which is kind of probably backwards, um, if I sample a frame and I get zero mites, I don't celebrate and think, great, I dig in and go again, grab another frame. I'm always trying to confirm that it's really zero. Um, yeah, when I have really low numbers, that's when sometimes I'll do a second or third sample in, in the hive, just to be sure. Would you do those same things the same, or would you go back a week later and sample it? Yeah, especially when you got a lot of cat brood, right? See, this this is, you know, this is my sort of pet peeve with the alcohol wash that it's, you know, in my mind, it's kind of the best method we have, but it's not a great method because, you know, if, especially this time of year, if you got a, a 10 frame box and there's, you know, six or seven frames of cat brood in there um, and you don't find any mites, there's a good chance there's a lot of mites under that cap. So yeah, exactly. That's a good point, Robert. When I've got a lot of cat brood and I get zeros, yeah, I, I don't celebrate. I'm going back in. I'm checking that one again a week or two because I don't want to be surprised come you know October, November with a high mite count. Yeah. A couple of folks are asking about PPE when applying the strips. Yeah, good question. Um, typically, nitro gloves is what I wear. Um, a respirator is not required uh, as per the Canadian label and the US label. Um, it's a good idea when you're opening the strips to, you know, consciously keep it away from your face when you're opening. You don't want to have it really close up to your face because the vapors are quite strong. I try to stand, stand downwind. Um, and even when you take the spent strips out, even though the strips are dead and you don't smell anything, you should still put on nitro gloves when you take the strips out. Um, I've, I spoke to some commercial beekeepers who are treating hundreds and some, some thousands of colonies in a case where those guys are, their crews are applying strips all day long. Some of those guys would put on a respirator because you're just exposing yourself to it all day long. But typically, you know, small scale beekeepers doing a few hives, respirator is not required. Again, you know, very different than auxilic acid. If you're vaporizing or using the sublimation method, auxilic acid, that va that uh, cartridge respirator is not a suggestion. You need to have that. You know, breathing in formic acid is unpleasant, and you get this sort of reflex kickback. But breathing in auxilic acid, those crystals will get caught, cut and trapped in your lungs. You definitely want a PPV with the auxilic is a full face respirator. Hey, Tom, there, there, there's a question that talks about, uh, you know, why is there guidance not to feed when applying and can you apply it when the hive is queenless, like when a, a new queen is coming back? And yeah. um, that, that brings up also another question is when, it, when it, is there such a thing when a queen is too new that you can't do this? How does all that work? Uh, let's do the feed question first and then we'll go to the queen question. Um, with the feed question, uh, I was puzzled by that one when I started at Nod, right? Um, we, we did some internal research and the research was done with in-high feeders. And my original assumption was you had a higher bee mortality with the hives that were fed. But when I went back and read it, it was like, no, not higher bee, how, actually higher colony mortality. Um, the colonies that were internally fed had a much higher um, mortality rate over winter. They, did, they didn't survive the winter. Um, that's uh, a trial that with our new researcher, Heather, we might be re-looking at uh, because anecdotally, here's what I get. I get people who tell me, no, I've actually used your product lots of times and uh, within high feeders and haven't had a negative outcome, right? I have commercial beekeepers tell us, yeah, we always did the way you said, not feeding, but then a couple of times we tried feeding and yeah, definitely had a negative outcome. You don't want to feed when they're in. Um, so we're taking the sort of cautionary approach with that one, but I think we really need a bigger research trial with different types of feeders. Um, yeah, I would like to see that. And what happens as to why we have higher colony mortality? I have no idea. We don't know what's happening. Um, but I think that's one that we may be doing further research on. I would, if, if at all possible, I'd love to see that sort of caution taken off the label 
but until we can prove that you know the in high feeding doesn't have a negative impact, we're going to leave it on. Um, yeah, so sorry, I can't tell you more on that. That's kind of where we're at with that one. Um, with the queen, um, you know, when you're introducing new queens, there's always that will the queen be accepted? You know, does she have a strong pheromone scent? You know, have they are they done with the other queen? We we suspect that when we have super seizure issues when using formic acid, Max or formic pro, we suspect what's happening is um, your older queens are starting to put out a weaker scent. We introduced the formic acid, it masks her scent. They, they think she's done, they supersede. Um, with introducing a new queen, my thinking is, and again, this, this is my personal thinking on this. We, we, we don't have data or science on this. So take this with a grain of salt. But I think when you're introducing a new queen, they're getting used to her scent. You know, they, she hasn't been accepted yet. You really don't know how strong her, like if, you, if, you, if she was mailed to you, maybe she's not laying, so she may have a weaker scent. That's why um, sometimes we have acceptance problems with queens because they're, they're not laying, they stop laying for a few days. I think if you introduce formic acid, you could be making that worse. So, so I would say- so, I'm sorry, would, Tom. My, my question is more around, you know, if I have like say 50 hives that I'm treating, and one of them just swarmed and it's in a queenless state, you know, it's easier for me to just apply the formic acid on it, you know, instead of closing her up, waiting for a mated queen and then coming back. Yeah, is I agree. That, yeah. Is that an acceptable state? Yeah, I've done that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I just hesitate people who are like treating and dropping a new queen at the same time. I think you're asking for problems with that. I have a question. Go ahead, Jean. Okay, thanks. Um, just, I'm, I want to go back to the feed question. Um, I don't remember the gal that I talked with at Nod about this, but I was explaining that I happen to have several mediums that the population was low. There weren't more than five or six frames of bees in those two boxes of mediums altogether. And the concern was if I use the one strip method, I had, I had two things I had to be concerned about, that this hive needed to be fed, but I also wanted to get some um, product on knowing that we're going into mid-August and I wanted to address the issue of the winter bee emergence come you know, mid-August. And her recommendation was, that it was appropriate to feed, to put a pail feeder over the hive. Like, so it's medium box, medium box, um, formic, uh, extra box of um, super, a, a super with frames, and then the inner cover like you would normally have, and then the feed pail. Um, that was a, re a recommendation. Can you ad address that? Yeah, that, that, that would be, yeah, my understanding from what we talk about and everything internally we talk about, that would be a no. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, because I use pails. That's how my method of feeding is pail feeding. <clears throat> I've never pail, pail fed when I had stripped in. I, I think the question really is, is what's the higher risk? Is it higher risk starvation or the higher risk mites? If there's, if there's so little feed in there that you could be up against starvation, um, I would feed them for a couple of days, even get some feed into them, take the feeder off and then treat. Okay. Yeah. Um, don't, okay. yeah unless, unless, well, I mean, I'm not sure if who would have told you that. I mean, it's possible, but no, that's, that's not our, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Tom, um, there's a question on what if the colony is in the middle of requeening so there are queen cells in the colony but there's a high mite load would you would you treat or would you wait until the queen emerges i'd treat with the queen cells okay yeah um, yeah I'd, I'd be trying to knock i would be trying to knock the mites down um because you because then you're up against you know treating with a with a new queen right I treat right. with the queen cells, and then you know, worst case scenario, if, if it damaged the queen, you requeen. But treating, you know, waiting for that queen to hatch out, a newly queen before she's really accepted, and then treating, 
um, you're masking her pheromone and you're again risking supersedure. Makes sense. On the topic of new queens, would you tweet, would you uh, treat with um, formic with uh, a queen that's only a month old, given that there's at least six frames of bees? Well, if she's, if she's been in there for a month, she's accepted, right? She's accepted, she's laying, uh, she's a month old and she's laying, she's probably putting on a pretty strong pheromone scent. Um, so, but, so, but now you're talking hive strength. That's a different question, right? If you if you if you got at least six frames of bees and she's laying and there's brood, um, yeah, more than six frames of bee, bees I would treat. Um, but again, you know, like I said, when I go to my colonies, I'm typically always using two strips. But if I get to a colony, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, is there really five or six? I'm kind of on the fence about how strong this colony is. Then I do the one plus one method. Right. And we're talking, um, I'm a new beekeeper. So you're talking about just the amount of bees covering a frame when you take off the inner cover and look at the top of a brood box or the bottom, like if two brood boxes, then would you add the amount of bees okay. on the top brood box and the bottom brood box? Yeah, yeah. You know, if you got, if you got, if you got two brood boxes and bees are dispersed amongst the, the two boxes, you, you probably got enough bees in there, right? Got it. Thanks. Because you know, if I sometimes when I, when I was running doubles, if I had a problem, I had a weaker hive. You know, uh, one of the boxes doesn't have a lot of bees. In it. They're going to be about, with, yeah. What about one strip on the bottom brood box and one strip on the top of the brood box for a weak hive, but still two deeps? Well, again, you know, sure. it's, it's a brood treatment, so we're we're tr we're trying to penetrate the brood cap and kill mites under the cap, right? That's why we always say put the strips close to close to the brood nest. So I would still put them between the two, wherever the wherever, wherever the brood is, you know, in, in between the two boxes in the center. Got it. Thanks. We we you know we we I I hear people do that. I, I get that from a lot of people. Um, you know, it's not something we advocate. We haven't done testing with it. Um, but you know, beekeepers are beekeepers. Um, I I hear guys will put one on the top box, one on the on the, on the uh, in between the boxes. Our data tells us if you're trying to penetrate the root gap as close to the brood as possible. Ooh, thanks. You're yeah, welcome. Uh, Tom, if you were to develop a calendar for treating your bees, and I know we wanna measure mites before and after and track our records. Um, is there a calendar? Is there like, okay, April treats with formic, July treats with formic, number treats with formic, and then do oxalic acid after that? Or is, um, is there such thing as fixed schedule to treat your colonies? I, I struggle. I struggle with that, Robert, because you know that saying, "All beekeeping is local," and it goes by our. But more, but more importantly, right? Um, I go by, by, my, by my mite levels. I treat by mite levels. Like, okay, somebody asked me er, earlier when I, I treat, and I forgot to mention this, I'm sorry. This, this spring I did not treat. It's very unusual for me. Um, I did such a good job last year. And this spring, like I told you earlier in my talk, um, I did a lot of splitting. I doubled my colonies. So I had a lot of brood breaks. Um, when I did my, and I was on top of my monitoring, when I did my, because our weather was so much warmer this year, I did uh, my I did my first all call wash at the end of April. I was getting zeros. In May, I was getting zeros and one mite. In June, I was getting zeros and one mite. Um, with those kind of numbers, I didn't treat in the spring. Now I knew and I know that they're only going to go up, right? Uh, my last alcohol wash was was early Ju July, and I was still getting zeros um, and one mite, right? I did not get anything higher than one mite. Now I know I'll be treating in August. So my problem I have with the calendar, Robert, is that I also believe in IPM. Why treat if you don't have to? Why put chemicals in your hive if you don't have to? But the only way you can make that educated decision is to know your numbers. So are you willing to do alcohol washes every month? If you're not willing to do alcohol washes every month, then yeah, you might as well develop some sort of calendar where you treat, you know, 
formic spring, formic late summer, auxilic uh, early fall. And if you're open to using synthetic miticides, you know, apivar, apivar spring, formic acid late summer, auxilic acid fall. Um, so, you know what I'm saying? I prefer, I prefer IPM based on knowing your numbers than, than just treating prophylactically based on the calendar. I yeah. want to so the example, kind of pontificate the example about I, alcohol washes. <laughs> yeah, the example I gave earlier um, prompts me to ask, do you treat or do you test every single colony? Because we tested one colony, we got 12 mites, and then we tested the next one, we got zero. Yeah, when I had, you know, I, I was running for a long time around 10, 15 colonies. When I had 10, 15 colonies, I alcohol washed them all, you know, now, um, you know, I'm, I'm closer to 60 colonies. Uh, if I go into a yard with 20 colonies, I'm washing at least five, at least five. Um, it becomes okay. a time thing. If I had time, I had more time. Yeah. But, you know, we got to be practical too, right? I mean, if you yep. got the time and you got the manpower and you have a helper and you can wash them all, sure. Why not? But, you know, sometimes it just doesn't, we just don't have the time, time to do that, but at least get a good sample of the yard. You know, you know, I think at least 10% of the yard is a good number. Yeah. I like, you know, and again, regardless, regardless of the numbers, when you get a colony with such a high load, you're going to treat them all because the drones yeah. are going to move. They're going yeah. to move it. I, I, I agree. Numbers. Yeah, I agree. At that point, if, if I'm going through my yard and I got what you said, uh, like a 36, you said it was 36, right? So 12%. Correct. Yeah, that whole yard's getting yep. treated. You know, I might alcohol wash just for my own info and do some more alcohol washes. But at that point, I've already made up my mind that yard's getting treated. Even if and, the, and even we noticed the there was a lot of drones. we had a lot of drones in that colony, so I, I think I don't know maybe a wrong wrong um, cells in there, and the queen laid a whole lot of drones. I don't know what's going on, and the colony is very healthy. There was no signs of diseases, the, the brood pattern was solid, but uh, we, we sampled one frame, two frames actually, and we got that high log and it's like stunning. Yeah, I, I know my, myself, I had a, an interesting case that I, I started seeing a trend over a couple of years is, is at the University of Toronto, I have two roofs, one's on a sub, suburban campus, one's at the downtown campus. Um, I have a much harder time managing my mites on the downtown campus than I do in the suburban campus, because even after my August uh, treatment, um, there are so many other urban beekeepers in the downtown core, you know, some who are treating, some who are not treating, some host hives are crashing, that um, I'm always following up that yard with oxalic acid and always on top of that one. Um, so, you know, I, under, I understand intellectually how the mite bomb works, but that yard, I've experienced it. Yeah. So I'm still troubled on which one to use, the mite away quip strips or the Formic Pro? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you some, some feedback when I get back from customers. Um, we used to get a lot of feedback on, on the Mighty Way Crips on the Max that it was too strong, vapored off a little too fast, and was harder on the queens, right? Um, I think for smaller hobbyist beekeepers, sideliner beekeepers, I personally think Formic Pro is the better option. Um, I have a lot of commercial beekeepers who are use, have been using our products for years, so they kind of understand it. They know what they're up against. Their thinking is when they have a, they come across a yard and for whatever reason, the yard's out of control, they got really excessive high mite levels and they know they got a serious problem. They'll go with max two two strips and money because they know it's going to be um, um, the stronger option. They're going to get a bigger kill with that. And they might have higher queen loss, but they know what they're up against. If they don't, you know, you, you end up losing the yard. Um, and having said that, you know, I used Max for years and I, I didn't, I didn't have those queen loss issues. I had super procedure issues. Um, I know for myself, and I think this is, um, I think this is true of a lot of newer beekeepers that 
when we're on our learning curve of learning, um, I never dealt with queen issues until they were extreme. You know what I mean? Like I didn't deal with queen issues until I had laying workers, until I had drone layers. Um, if I saw a queen that was slowing down, I never went in there and killed that queen and replaced her, right? Um, so of course I was having much higher supersedure rates because they were doing it. Um, now, um, sounds blunt, but I, I, when I have a third year queen and I start seeing the signs of her failing, I don't wait until they supersede or until all of a sudden I've got a drone layer. You know, she gets introduced to the hive tool and I replace her. Um, so I think that has a lot to do with um, the queen loss issue too. Um, I think for many of us on the learning curve of beekeeping, that's, you know, managing our queens and being willing to repla re replace failing queens is something that doesn't happen until you've been keeping bees for a few years. So you just to recap, so you're saying for a, a, a bomb, a mite bomb, uh, stronger would be the max strips and then form it for just regular maintenance. Yeah, if I, yeah, if I had, if I had a really big, big problem, big issue. Um, yeah, I would use my way quick strips. Great. Hi, Tom, I have a question. Sure. Um, so when it's very hot out now and you're waiting for that second, third week of August to treat, what are you doing in the meantime to meantime, mitigate, mitigate mite numbers if you can? Yeah, well, uh, like myself personally right now, I'm feeling fairly, fairly confident because one, my numbers were very low in the spring and I did a lot of splitting. Like I, I, I made a lot of nukes and got a lot of new colonies. Um, so I, I had those brew breaks that obviously works in the favor of, you know, interrupting the reproductive cycle of the mites. So I'm not too concerned about that myself. Um, if I had really high mite loads um, and uh, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. See, that, that becomes the challenge this time of year, right? Like a good midsummer treatment. Uh, if your mite levels are at such a level that you, don't, you can't wait until you get the temperature window, you know, your, your other option is looking at other products, something that's not temperature sensitive. Um, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, see, auxilic's not really gonna ha ha happen if you've got a lot of cat brood. Um, you know, if you if you're if you're willing to sacrifice your honey, take your supers off, and not not take a honey crap, you always have the option of using a, a synthetic miticide, getting it in right away. Um, I think there's um, I'm not too familiar. I should be, and I'm, I'm not, but I think there's some uh, there's a couple of thymol products I think that are not as temperature sensitive that you could put in, but again, you might have to have supers off. Okay, and I'm first year, so um, I'm still working on getting my super foundation drawn out. Um, right. You mentioned drone layers, and so this is sort of off topic. I've noticed just recently in my last inspection, I have, a t I have way more drone brood than I've had all spring and summer so far. Is that a sign of a failing queen? Um normally you're going to see a lot more drones you know late spring early summer right if you're if you're starting to see a lot and if you're how many do you just have one how many colonies do you have so i have one colony um in two 10 frame deeps mm -hmm. and <clears throat> excuse me just just recently like in the last week or two the the drone population has exploded um and i'll say um drone brood yeah. They haven't hatched out yet, but I'm yeah. worried that there are a lot of mites in there. I haven't had any mites in any of my alcohol washes yet, but I um, noticed in one of the pictures I took upon my last inspection, it looked like I had a mite in an uncapped cell. So now I'm worried about what I can do in the meantime, as I'm waiting for temperatures to come down and put in my formic pro pads. I'm guess I'm guessing it's hard for me to know, but I'm guessing this time of year, if you're seeing a really high amount of drones this time of year, you might have an issue. You you may have a you may have a, you know I guess I guess you got to be able to tell the difference between laying workers or a, or a drone laying queen. Um, 
it might be worth having an experienced beekeeper in your take a look at that for you because okay. because um i'm not you know again i'm not in ohio but maybe someone in your area in ohio i mean if you're seeing a lot of drones this time of year to me that that's that's a warning sign possibly okay yeah i haven't seen any double eggs in cells but yeah i just thought it was weird that this time of year i would have so many drone cells yeah well if you were seeing multiple eggs that would be laying workers if you're just right. drone, that could be a failing queen you know she's okay she's, um yeah okay thank so you I'm, I'm starting to see less drones in my, in, in, my, in some of my colonies my big strong colonies still have drones right but but i came across the same issue that you're talking about i went to one of my colonies and i saw way too many drones i didn't see hardly any worker brood and i knew i had a problem okay and i seem to have a, a lot of worker brood as well i just didn't know if a good method of mitigation um would be to remove some of that drone brood one i'll be able to kind of inspect to see if there are mites in there um and two my thought is i don't need drones coming soon but I know that they do what they do for a reason, even though I may not understand it. So, yeah, I mean, some people use that method of as a cultural control, removing drone brood to um, because the mites tend to reproduce more in, in, the, in the drone brood. Mm -hmm. uh, you could take your a frame with the drone brood out and take your, you know, and scratching fork that you used to uncap frames and open up some and have a peek and see what kind of mite situation you have there. But if you're but if you're seeing mites already on the bees, chances are you have a high mite load. Yeah, I haven't seen them on the bees yet, but if I saw one, what I think was one inside an uncapped cell in a picture, then I, I'm sure that they're there, so. And, and your issue is you're up against the temperature, you're, you're not getting yeah. below uh, 85? Right. Hmm. Yeah, that's... Um... Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I face every August. You know, I start I start looking at the temperatures August 1st, looking for the window. Like I know where I am right now, where um, uh, they just started creeping back up. Well, like last week was a perfect week here for um, for treating with former pro. And now we're um, next next week. I'm, we're right on the, uh, you know, 83, 84 here. Um, which in your case, if, if my mite levels were that high and I did a wash, I think are high, I would probably still go ahead and treat. Okay. But, but again, you want to really, you know, if it's going to be above 85, I try to hold off. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sorry, I couldn't be more help on that. It's, it's hard when you're talking about, you know, high number of drones without really seeing it. Right. And Angel, uh, feel free to send an email to officers at summitbeekeepers.com and uh, we'll, we'll try to help you. Okay, great. Thank you. So Tom, can I just ask a quick follow-up with the issue of not using pale feeders? Right. So if tomorrow's day three, is it okay then just to go out and grab the pale feeder off? Well, you've already got, you've already got them on, eh? Um, right. That's what, again, I, I called and that's this, what was and, and this, re, this is recently? Yeah, just, it must have been two days ago. Um, delightful lady. Um, I called and went through to customer service. I didn't, I just don't know her name. We spoke for the longest time. Would have been, um, would have been yeah, Kathleen? I don't, I don't know if she even identified herself. You know, you, you know, her thinking may have been when you were talking to her, Jane, right? See, um, you know, if your bees are on the cusp of star starvation, right? They're going to. They're I mean, gonna I don't know if they're on the cusp of star, but you know, these are hives that have just they've struggled. You know, there there's not a lot of stores. Yeah. Um, and that's where the suggestion was: you can do both. You can treat, and you can give them a boost. You know, for what they need. Now, again, this is out of thirty hives, we're talking about five. Yeah. But I, I don't want to put those five in jeopardy. So if it means going out and, you know, pulling the pail, I, I mean, I'll gladly do that. But is that what you would suggest versus keeping it on? What are you seeing at the hive entrance? Are they flying or are there, is there movement? Are they foraging at all or no? Well, I mean, I, I, some are. I mean, some, some of the hives are. Some, some aren't. Um, I mean, today was a humid day overcast so there wasn't a lot of activity you know they're coming and going but not by you know yeah. by lots 
Yeah, I am. And you're at you're at day three now. Tomorrow will be day three. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you know, tomorrow's day three. Yeah. They're already on at this point. If there was any serious damage, it would be done. Um, because like I say, most of the vapor offs the first few days, right? Um, right. No, if you're really concerned about, about starvation, I'd leave them on. Yeah. Tom, what is the logical reasoning behind taking the, the in-hive feeders off? Is that just less room for the vapors to get in the box where there's less bees? No, we, we don't know, actually. That's it. I'm just saying we did an internal, inter, internal study and the hives that had internal feeders, but see, the, in our study, we use frame feeders inside, right? And, and the, you know, the, my question is, I don't use frame feeders, my, I use pail feeders on top, right? Could be different. You know, I don't know. I think the trial should have been done with all several different types of feeders and- Got it. I, I, yeah, I, I think the trial was not uh, as sort of, um, what's, what's what I wanna say? Um, I think we need a stronger trial, you know, with more colonies, different types of feeders. Um, I think it should be revisited. Because here's here's my here's here's my thinking on that is uh, you have we can have we have wet supers on top of the bees with uh, with the treatment in, right? If they're bringing a nectar and they got a box full of nectar above and you put the treatment in, um, that does, we don't have a negative impact with that. Yeah, I, I know it's, it, seems like, it seems like I'm giving you a mixed message, Shane, but seeing how you already have them on, I, I'd probably leave them on. Okay. See, because if, if, they're, if they're stressed, if they're stressed and they need feed and you, yeah. you, you, know, you put in the formic, it's like just another stressor. Right. So at least this way, if they're fed, they're, they're stronger, they're, they're sort of, um, you know, we like to say fat, well-fed beads hand to handle the formic better. Again, you know, I mean, I, I've done this like, for 15 like years. I, I've never, I've never put feeders on. I mean, yeah. ever, ever. But what was so different about this time, which is why I had the conversation with whoever I spoke with, was that you were just looking at much. I mean, I've never just dealt with two mediums. I mean, my hives are pretty robust. These were nukes that just just struggle. They've struggled the entire spring into summer. So mm -hmm. here we are in August with two medium boxes of five or six frames of brood, right? Uh, and that's all, that's not a lot. And so the, again, the question was, do I even bother treating? Yes, I do want to treat, but I, I really felt like I was putting them in jeopardy by not, you know, by not feeding them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like I said, it's not, this is not normal. I, I've never, it, you know, it's been really clear, don't feed. And that's what I've, I've always done. But like I said, I, I, I was so bothered by this. And that's where the suggestion came. And part of the rationale was that it's not interfering with ventilation of vapors within the hive, that it's you know above, on top. Again, I had no, I, I, I took the advice um, and did it, so. And what do you have, one strip or two strips in? I just have one strip. These guys can't handle two strips. Yeah, yeah, okay. So just the one strip. Yeah, so. Let it let it run it let it run its course for ten days, right? Okay. Yeah. I'd love you to give me a shout, like before you put the second strip in, to say what's the calling look like. Have you seen mm. any negative impact or? Yeah. I'd be I'm really curious because I I'm sort of um. You know I, I think we we I think we have uh, more more questions and answers when it comes to that issue of feeding, um, okay. and feeding at the same time. Okay. All right. Well, again, as long as you know you're feeling is that it's not going to do more my I, I i'm not interested in doing more harm right if i if i've done something that was harmful i want to i want to do something differently about that so yeah. again i have no problem going and hauling those feeders off but i, I just i'd leave like, them i'd leave i'd leave them at this point all right because i sometimes sometimes it's a case of trust your instinct like you you, you say me you seem very concerned about that with them not having enough feed right Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yep. like, yeah. All um, right. Thank Tom, you. Um, 
there's a question I don't want to miss, and it may have been answered. Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but Laura asked, is there a time limit between treatments? So example, this one colony where I have 36 mites per 300 or, or 12% mite load, um, can, and I test it a week after the treatment is finished and I see 5% load, do I treat again? Yeah, you... We, we, we used to recommend at least a month be between treatments. Uh, I think that's too much. If you went back and you had a five, you had 5%, I would even go back in maybe with the one plus one. Okay. Yeah. Um, or, or wait a little longer, you know, your, your, your options would be, you know, wait at least a couple of weeks before you put two full strips in there. But I, I would probably go right back in with one strip. Because you know, you know how it is. They're they're only going one way. When you've got five percent, they're reproducing. They're only going back up, right? So you want you want to knock them down. Yep. Uh, any other questions? Um, we're we've gone a little bit over the limit. I apologize, Tom. Oh no, no, I'm good. I'm no apologies for me. I'm you know I'm happy to answer these questions because I know it's. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not the easiest product to learn and it, it's, you know, so no, I'm happy to do this anytime. And any, and anybody who's, um, who's on here, you know, if you, you find yourself in a situation tomorrow saying, Oh, I just, I wish I would have asked that. Um, you could always get me an extension 216. We got an 800 number and I'm, I'm always available. So, um, you know, the, feel free to reach out anytime. And let everybody know this was recorded and we'll uh, put a link up on our YouTube page. And I do have an announcement. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I secured Dr. Jamie Ellis. She's going to be speaking for us in November. Nice. Uh, to be precise, November 16th. So we'll send uh, a blast of email reminding you of it. Uh, and the topic is going to be on the health of the queen and the health of your colony. He's a great speaker. We also secured another uh, doctor from the University of Florida to speak about mites, Dr. Cameron, uh, but that would be in March. We figured that would be a great month to talk about mites again. Awesome, thank we, you so much, Robert, Randy, and uh, yeah, Tom. Thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. I really I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Thanks again. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Thank Tom. Thanks, Robert. Take care.